Well, hello, listeners, and welcome back to the Purposeful Marketing Podcast. Aaron, Mary, James here with a special guest. We're really excited for this. Um, Co-founder of DreamData.io, Stefan here. And we're going to really talk about a topic that we've had themes throughout all our episodes because it impacts us every single day. And that's really um, attribution, it's measurement, it's goals. And really, we want to talk through the lens and the framing of what do B2B marketers know that they shouldn't should know now, right? And let me kind of clarify that for you again here is um, because it is difficult. It's, you know, if you don't get it right at the beginning, you're not going to know what you need at the end. And we're going to kind of talk through this, deconstruct it, um, really break it down in different ways from my perspective, Mary James and Stefan's perspective. So before we get into the topics, I just want to throw it over to Stefan and you just want to kind of give a intro context, streamdata.io, um, give it to us. We'll listen. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it pretty short. Uh, yeah, today I'm the CMO and co-founder of DreamData, uh, a B2B revenue attribution platform. So what we do is trying to explain how our customers produce pipeline and revenue. My background is uh, B2B marketing and growth. That's basically all I've done since I, I finished university. And I've been playing around in this game for like 10, 12 years now or, or something like that. So <laughs> speaking of what you said, I've met, done a lot of stuff that I wish I knew <laughs> earlier that we can try to <laughs> kind of go over uh, during this conversation. Love it. Love it. And I think um, for the first question is, and Mary, I'm probably going to pass this to you, is what makes attribution so difficult and like why does it impact your strategy um when you're kind of planning your go-to-market strategy yeah that's an awesome question uh the thing that makes attribution the most difficult right now in the digital space is that you can't attribute every single activity on your website or in your crm to a single source so a lot of people want to say hey, they get a high quality lead, right? And this high quality lead turns out to be an excellent opportunity for the company. Um, they want to trace it back and say, okay, where did this lead come from? How can we double down on that source? But it gets a lot more complicated than that. So I'll use Gorilla76 as an example. Um, we have a podcast, we have a live event, we have a lot of employees on LinkedIn. If that really high quality lead who turned into an opportunity has been consuming content on our employees' LinkedIn page for a while, um, has attended a couple industrial marketing live, and then maybe listens to a podcast episode from one of the two podcasts we have, there's only so much that software is going to be able to capture from that journey. So attributing that lead to a single source is extremely difficult. So that's when we as Gorilla76, if we were obsessed with attribution, would say, well, where'd this lead come from? Like, what do we need to do more of? Do we need to do more industrial marketing live? Do we need to do more LinkedIn? Do we need to do more podcasts? And I think that's where um, you get kind of caught in the weeds is trying to attribute every opportunity to a single um, marketing channel. I think that's very well laid out there, Mary. And it really speaks to kind of really the general pains. Um, yeah, I know from doing this from the performance marketing side is my day-to-day -day pain is making sure all those dots are in line so we can kind of tell that data story um, to leadership team, to the board, to whoever needs to kind of really see the show and tell. Um, and I think as my career has expanded doing this is like, it just gets harder and harder. Like um, it was much easier when I was just running um, Facebook ads and Google ads maybe like five years ago. And now it's becoming more difficult. There's more channels, more platforms and all that. So. Yeah, I'll throw it over to you, Stefan. It's you're building a product to help solve these issues. But um, do you have any insight again? Like, if you're going to help a team, uh, marketing team, and they needed a product, it's like, what do they need to know to start um, the right way? Do you have any com comments on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think first of all, I think Mary is on on the right path there. That like so much stuff is happening that impacts your your customer journeys, and you're definitely never catching a uh, hundred percent of it. So. I think that's where like the marketing also becomes a bit of a, a craft and a science uh, at the same time. And like sometimes you need to, to use the gut more than you need to use what, what's measurable. And other times there are tactics that, that are measurable. Um, I think that just to add to, to what Mary said there as well, like I think the first thing you need to understand when you jump into this uh, game that is B2B is that 
all the tools that you're using most likely are wired to understand the B2C scenario, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google ads, etc. All of them, they look at individuals or even worse, just individual browsers clicking on your ad and then arriving to your website. So you need to know that this is a limitation. That they're looking at individuals and what you are facing in B2B is that you're trying to convince a team of people, a buying committee, to make a decision uh, about what you do. So there's multiple people doing stuff here. And just because you know one of those five people in the buying committee, it doesn't mean you, you have the full picture. We call this thinking about account-based, an account-based data model or an account-based timeline. That's that we can bucket that for a, for a later topic. I would say the first thing I would approach, I think Aaron, like you, I, I come very much from, from digital marketing and, I think the first thing I'll be doing if I want to understand attribution better uh, or knowing what works is be, that's really what I perceive attribution as is. I just want to know what works <laughs> and then you can call it attribution or you can call it just one, wanting to win or whatever we want to call it. Um, I would start looking at my activities and st start thinking about are they leaving behind digital traces and you know, there's, you know, do you have salespeople? Do they just sit on their phone, call customers, leaving no trace behind that they actually touch this account? Well, then force them to call through your CRM or use a piece of calling software so it leaves a trace behind. The same if, you know, your customer support right now is just uh, a Gmail inbox. Maybe force them to move into uh, software intended for these things. And, and so I think you can go kind of through your organization and think, are we really doing what we can right now to, to build up these digital reflections so that when time comes, we can actually go back and, and look, through, uh, look through the data. And then yeah, that said, I would always just start out with the simplest thing, which is when you have sales like meetings, sales meeting conversations, ask people, where did you hear about us from? Like have that anecdote of what seems to be working here. Uh, the same way with offering the forms where you say, where did you hear us about us from? It's a good, it's not telling 100% of the truth, but it's a, it's a low effort uh, thing that you can do where you actually learn a little bit about how your go-to-market work. Yeah, I think there's so many great things in, in your answer there. And I, one thing I'm going to latch on to is um, being able to tell the story is of what works and what doesn't work. It, it's just not data alone. <laughs> and I think that's the pain point with um, attribution is this data is giving us directional feedback, but what can kind of help us tell the story, and this is James where I'm gonna pull you in, is um, if you talk to your customers <laughs> and you do it frequently, like that's the qualitative insights we can bring to equip ourselves when we get to the attribution. I know, um, James, if you wanna make any comments just about customer research and kind of help how that helps us in our marketing strategy, I think that's a great thing to kind of preface here is like you can do other things, other activities that will help your data later on. Yeah, I think that maybe the only thing I would say, I think Stefan hit it on the head when he's, you know, he's basically suggesting you can just start asking the people that are trying to work with you what worked to get them over. You can just ask them. Um, I think if you don't have any of that feedback, and you haven't generated like a lot of historical data in that regard, but you're talking to prospective customers, just asking them where they spend time and asking them about their decision-making process to purchase, say, if you're selling a SaaS tool, how they would determine that how, what their decision-making process is to buy a SaaS tool. If you're selling, um, you know, if you're selling casters and hand trucks to, um, equipment manufacturers, then ask the person who, who's in charge of purchasing that, like what their decision-making process is like, do they talk to their peers? Do they go online? Do they ask people on social media? Do they get into a Facebook group? Um, like that can, that can give you the, maybe the feedback you need to know where you need to look, um, to, to set some expectations so that you just don't, try every single thing. And then when you get really flat or unpredictable lines of data, um, 
you you don't remain confused about what's going on. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think Stefan pretty much nailed it uh, in that regard. Yeah, and I think, again, with the point of just talking to your team and your customers frequently and often, um, what that's going to do is help you understand kind of what their reservations are. You know, like, what, what do you not get now? Let me go use the data, use attribution to help tell that story. And also let me do some storytelling. I think that's a big piece of it. So, um, Mary, I'm going to just flat out ask you, since you do this process probably the most, is like, how do I explain pipeline and revenue? Like, what is your biggest pain point with attribution in, in this conversation we're talking about? Yeah, so we have simplified it immensely because we used to try and attribute pipeline and revenue to as many lead sources as we were working in. So we run an agency. So we um, do and conduct work for our clients in very particular channels that are well-defined, namely paid social, LinkedIn, and then the website. So we have gotten it down to the only way now that we attribute pipeline and revenue is coming through the website. So are you getting more high quality leads that are turning into pipeline? And is that pipeline turning into the revenue? And is that original source, the website? That is it. That's how much we've simplified attribution because it was just such a pain point before that we couldn't get over the hump for a lot of our clients. And this is finally something, this message is resonating. So we're finally finding, simplifying it down to that is, okay, I get it. Now I understand. Love it. And I think, um, okay, on dreamdata.io, because I was looking at this earlier, Stefan is like, there's this graphic that I think tells a story so well. There's a before and after. And like on the before, it's all these different points that Mary's just talking about. And it's like so overwhelming. And then the after is single source of truth and it's all connected. Um, as you're working and building this product for marketers, like can you kind of speak more to like the pains you're solving and kind of what you're seeing? Yeah. I would uh, again actually very much agree with Mary, and I think the I think it's very popular to say that marketing should be accountable for revenue, and we should. But it's a very uh, very much a lacking indicator of our activities, uh, and in some benchmarks we put out, it took uh, 192 days from first touch until a deal being won, and it's not like we can sit down and wait for six months to see if it worked or not. So you need something that is much more a leading indicator. And I, I'm a big fan of the, the booked call, uh, booked demo, as what marketing should be paying a lot of attention to and the quality of those that are booking these, uh, these demos. Because there's a relatively short cycle between your do an activity and then you book a demo. Um, but still, I would say, uh, so just to, to anecdote our own data on our own account, when we have a demo called booked, uh, there's an average of four visits involved in, in getting a, a, a demo booked. Now, what that means is that if you go to the CRM system, nine out of 10 times, it will say direct as the original source because the CRM system captures the session in which the demo is booked. If you didn't track back that journey, then second last session was probably also direct. But then you're looking at somebody who came from organic search because they became aware of what you do by a marketing activity, which could be paid SEO or referral or something like that. So by not being able to connect those four dots together, then if you only have, that's typically what marketers do have, they have Google Analytics and the CRM system to try to understand what's working. And the CRM system only grabs such a little uh, <laughs> bit of what, what's actually going on. So what we're trying to do for our customers is to make the journey more rich and more uh, expl explainable. I would, I would be the first to say we're not trying to invent one. We're not trying to invent something that's not there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we're just, we're, I think very much of it as trying to constantly identify the outliers, whether that's positive or negative ones. So if you think like a bell curve, normal distribution, we're trying to find stuff that looks significantly bad because we're spending a lot of resources and nothing is coming out of it or we're spending resources here and we can actually see quite good proof that they are consistently present when demo calls are booked and if you kind of work in those two outliers most of the time then <laughs> in theory at least then over time things things can get better but the essential thing we do for our clients is helping 
taking those things that leaves that digital reflection behind and building that into mm. like a customer journey. And I'm deliberately saying those things that leave behind a digital reflection because not all things do this, but there are things that do, and it's those things we can help uh, help you act on. Okay, so I have a follow-up question on because I, I think what you said is very interesting. I, I think maybe the primary challenge as I see it in terms of using this data, like in making it valuable after you've collected it is, is achieving what you said you're trying to do, which is make it rich, but also explainable. Like, and I think sometimes how you try and achieve making that story rich makes it, it like muddies the waters and it makes it not simple enough. And so like, yeah. If you could um, maybe kind of talk through how you see, like, maybe Dream Data's approach to, like, giving you something rich and robust and yeah. complete, but also giving you it, giving it to you in a simple way so that you can actually act on it or talk to leadership about it or um, show it to someone who has never seen marketing data before, et cetera. <laughs> yeah. And I think like, that this goes for any product tool, data, anywhere, like you want to have it because it helps you make decisions. It helps you act and hopefully act in a way that makes you prosper. So I, I definitely understand the concern of increasing complexity too much. It's actually why I'm a quite big fan of the first touch attribution model. Like if I can find things that consistently are starting journeys, that's really, really helpful because then I can look to repeat those. Whereas I couldn't care more less of a, of a last touch model in B2B, B2B because maybe it's an email, maybe it's a call, maybe it's a meeting. Like it's going to be sales activities anyway. And I can't really like uniquely in, impact these things. But those things that are the very first touch on the journeys that go far down our pipeline, that's typically the dose that I would be be looking for. Yeah, I I like that answer. I feel like that aligns a lot with gorillas, with most of the thinking of folks at Gorilla. And I think that it's it's something that comes from the experience of like a lot of our clients. They have really robust teams to take a lead and turn it into a sale. And they've got a lot of resources dedicated to that. And these teams are super effective and they've been working. These companies are where they are because those teams are good at what they do. Um, and then when we communicate with them, when they're kind of getting into marketing, um, it's we, the leads don't, the leads don't need to be high quality. We've got this great team and it's like, well, what, like we can make, we can do more for them. Um, if we focus on, if we really, if we get really early in the journey and focus on first touch, just generating demand, just like creating interest, um, you will get more of those folks. It, it doesn't look like that. Like just, just trust the team and trust the process. Like the, the idea of like focusing on first touch just reads to me, like we trust our team and our product and our process to work marketing's job is just going to be generating moving someone to make that first interested decision which you know is admittedly very hard when interest is in a four hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment you know that's not always easy but if that's all marketing has to do because you've got this robust team that you've already grown back before digital marketing was a necessary thing they can still do their work um and they'll still be super valuable. Uh, and marketing will do more for them if marketing only focuses on getting people interested in the very first place. So I think two, two things I want to speak about, because we talked about so many great things there. <laughs> like number one was digital reflections, which I think is awesome. And then number two, kind of James, what you're talking about is, um, understanding the, the sales and marketing handoff. So I'm going to start with digital reflection because I, I think that's important with what we're talking about with attribution here is um, I think specifically there's things you should do differently. I think this is what I've learned now that I wish I knew before. 
And that's one of them is utilizing the data and the qualitative insights to kind of help tell that story, that digital reflection over time. As a performance marketer, I can give you so many examples of um, using a platform like LinkedIn ads, where um, I have a little more data to kind of see who interacts and they have firmer graphic fit and they have the job title. I can see that they engaged with a podcast ad 90 days ago. That's kind of, that's the first touch, right? And then maybe 90 days, 180 days later, especially if we're talking about Grilla 76 clients with their buying cycles, because this is seven figure heavy equipment that complex B2B buying cycle, right? So I think that's kind of the digital reflection um, activities that I wish we did more of. I think what happens is we're so obsessed over the attribution, right? Or maybe the tools don't exist to really show us this digital reflection. And then we start doing different things. Another piece to that is um, going back to book of demos and maybe again for Gorilla 76 clients, it's talk to engineers. What you're actually trying to measure is so important because that's actual sales conversation. Where again, if you're just trying to attribute last click data, it's like you may be doing different activities. So again, I think if you can focus on anything, digital reflections, like take this out of this episode, <laughs> explore it yourself. I think that's really interesting. Um, so I'll let you, Mary, you want to respond on that? Because I think, again, storytelling, digital reflection, you're doing a lot of this. Is there anything you're doing differently to solve it? Yeah, um, I'm really glad we talked about this too. And I love that Stefan highlighted the first touch over the last touch, because I think that is also so important. Because from a girl of 76 standpoint, what we really run for our clients is their total content strategy. So what types of content should they be creating and why, how are they going to put that content in front of their customers and what first touch can do is inform your content strategy. So which of your content pillars are working, which aren't, and how can you trace that back through to the sales process? So yes, I think digital reflection is an amazing um, analogy or metaphor for what we're trying to do, which is really just inform content strategy. Perfect. Okay. So then I'll pivot to the next topic. Then Stefan, I'll let you respond here is um, the sales to marketing handoff. I think that's where attribution becomes a pain point for customers and who we work with is, you know, it's not very clear or it's not simplified as we used before, or there is no digital reflection. We're just talking about um, data without context. That makes it a very difficult conversation with the marketing and sales teams as we're saying, hey, our data is going up, right? <laughs> we have more of it. Um, and the sales team is like, well, those aren't the qualified opportunities we need. Our, that's not the customers we want to talk to. Again, like how do you help solve that, right? Is um, is an attribution problem? Is it, again, building tools that help show this digital reflection? I'll just kind of let you take that where you want to. <laughs> I can go many directions. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think the uh, sort of like rule number one in marketing is that our score uh, in B2B marketing, our scorecard is sales. So why, the reason why we do marketing is to sell more. And that means that this infliction point between uh, marketing and sales is, is, is so critical for us because we can do the best marketing in the world. But if the salespeople doesn't say, like you say, Aaron, oh, this is just crap leads. We don't want to work on these, though they're of super high quality, in your opinion, that all the money you've spent generating those leads are almost uh, wasted. Or you can be generating thousands of leads of low quality and then you waste your salespeople's time <laughs> calling these guys, writing these guys, and no sales comes out of it. So this kind of, I think the most important thing you can do is to kind of like force your company's revenue teams to think about as them being part of just one journey. And kind of, if you're dissatisfied with the leads that marketing bring in, then walk into the marketing room physically or digitally and tell them, look, I don't think the leads are really good right now. They should more look like this. Could you please try and go out and <laughs> attract more of those? Or if you as a marketer are in doubt whether what happened, what becomes of the leads, are they good enough quality? Uh, are they not prepared enough, etc.? Then walk into the sales team and ask them <laughs> about these things. So, and so forget kind of that siloed thinking about driving up some random metrics of emails collected or something like that and like, get together, have some beers, uh, eat lunch together, etc. <laughs> it's like, it's, 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 it's 
I've not worked in huge corporations, so I don't know kind of how silos kind of builds up sometimes. But for the places I've worked, it's been natural to kind of speak together about these topics. So, so before anything, I would just like focus on like trying to understand what makes up a good sales conversation. And if you don't understand this, then then try to to understand it. I can say for for Dream that ourselves um, doing this uh, ideal customer profile definition has really been a really good alignment effort across the the whole company. Meaning that marketing knows who we're trying to attract. Sales only try to sell to these people. The product team knows who are we building features for, etc. So everybody is at like in a broad scale trying to move in the same uh, direction that's a start i can easily i can easily say more you know stefan it's incredibly refreshing at least for me and probably also for mary and aaron to to hear someone say something like well you know what makes solving these problems easier is just going in a, if you're a marketer and you've got questions how about you just go ask them to the sales team how about you hold yourself a little bit accountable for having conversations that that make you work better um, if you're a salesperson that has a problem with the marketing results you're getting why not just go you know hold yourself accountable for having that conversation hold your marketing team accountable for helping you out like i think a lot of times these conversations end up with people when you hear people talking about this there's all sorts of well you can structure your company this way you can um you can apply like this thinking to how you set up your sales team or you can get rid of this sales function. And it's like, you could just start with have your team, hold your teams accountable for working together. Yeah. And like, and see what happens from there. Just to supplement that James then kind of, I think the, an easy trick is, as well is to like now married and produces a lot of content, but like insist on, one marketer needs to sit in on the weekly pipeline meeting that the sales team have. So you listen to what are they talking about? Because if the same questions appears multiple times, a marketer would immediately think, let me do a really good one to many answer here. Uh, instead of thinking that I have to gate the answer behind the salesperson. So, so I think in that sense, it's kind of <laughs> marketers are good at spotting things that here I can actually address a persona, which we have a lot of, and then, Salespeople don't have to at least deal with that one question. And over time, you get to probably have better sales conversations if your website and like rest of your content contains answers to these things. Yeah, that's a lovely back and forth. I think um, I, I did work at a very large corporation, <laughs> Fortune 50 Corporation and Marketing Department. And um, how the silos happen is I'm given one metric and one activity to do. And that's it. <laughs> And we don't have these kind of touch points, but what we've talked about before in the show, and I think it's really important as a marketer is um, go reach out, <laughs> go try to talk to people. One of my favorite activities was um, going to talk to the subject matter experts, the product specialists, going on sales drives um, to see equipment. I think that really makes you better as a marketer. And again, it doesn't have anything to do with attribution, but what it makes you do is understand and empathize with the people that you're going to work with. And if you're going to show them data, show them the storytelling, you know how to tell a much better story if you do so. So I think that was um, a lovely segment that we did there. Um, we're getting about time here, so I'm going to kind of wrap us up. Um, I think if you listen to this episode, the things that I pulled out that are really important is what you need to know now is simplify. <laughs> you know, how can I start simple, right? Um, what should I measure and why? Um, the book, the demos, talk to the engineers. Those are high intent. Those are important. Um, let's not just measure last touch because it's easy to see, right? And also think about how you're measuring and how does that impact the story you're going to tell later? Um, I think it's really important. And lastly is um, talk to sales. <laughs> you know, again, marketers, you don't always have this opportunity. I know, um, Mary, you talk to salespeople all the time. I try to at least network with them on LinkedIn every once in a while, um, just to kind of get that freshness of um, working with a different department there. So Stefan, I'm just going to kind of throw it over to you. Do you have like call to action for the listeners? I'll put the dreamdata.io link um, in our show notes, I'll kind of make sure everyone has access to that, but just any last final thoughts? No, that basically find me on LinkedIn. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. And then, uh, yeah, we have a, a free product with dream data, which is uh, basically a uh, Google analytics for B2B companies. And people can try that out if, and see, dip their toes and see if they, if they like that. 
Lovely, lovely. Well, listeners, appreciate you for stopping in. Again, this is a space as we have new listeners here. Um, we're really just trying to talk about bigger problems, the why, um, sometimes the nitty gritty, but maybe things that you encounter every day. And if you want to come on the show, I'm inviting anyone. <laughs> you know, it can be co-founders, CMOs, um, just marketers that are just starting their careers. I just want to have good marketing conversations. So is Mary and Jane's. So you can find this episode on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, um, Google. We're putting them on YouTube. They're everywhere. Um, we appreciate your feedback. Always DM us if you have questions. We like to talk to people in person if we can. So have a good one, listeners, and um, appreciate you. And thank you for listening. Thanks, Stefan. <laughs>